Hello, and welcome to another episode of Balanced Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to introduce to you now. Jane Barlow Christensen is a master herbalist and owner and chief visionary officer of her company, Barlow Herbal. Jane grew up with herbs and plant medicines through her entire life. She learned her father's trade and gained knowledge by working side by side with him in the field. From learning the precise harvesting seasons for each herb type to the specific ways to dry, process, and create potent concentrated extracts, Jane truly understands how to capture the healing powers from the earth. Jane's passion for the beauty industry, coupled with her master herbalist knowledge, provides a unique edge when creating very specialized health and beauty products. She is the recent author of the absolutely beautiful book, Be Your Own Shaman, a field guide to utilize 94 of the world's most healing plants, heavily influenced by the work of her father and written with her son and super cool dude, Brian Christensen. Jane is a dear friend who I've known for years, and her husband, Tim, has been a personal training client of mine since 2009, who is also a dear friend, and it is such an overdue honor to welcome Jane to Balanced Body Radio. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. I agree. Overdue, because I see you all the time, but it's like... Yeah, no, but thank you for having me on, Casey. Very, very much overdue. I do get to see you all the time. So we kind of split the time where I train your husband. Ever since the pandemic, sometimes we'll train at your warehouse. So I get to see that side of the company and see everybody packing orders and everything while we're working out upstairs. Other times we're down in the garage where you're working and where your son, Brian, also works. And so, yeah, depending on who, who is where and what's going on, I, I get to run into you quite a bit. It's kind of fun. Yeah, and there's a lot going on. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a lot going on. Yes, I can happily report to you that the employees of the warehouse do a great job. They're always busy. I get to see it with my own two uh, two eyes. And so just so you know, they're doing a great job. Yeah, it's. I have a pretty amazing team and I couldn't do what I do without them. I think that we always, yeah. as a business owner, you kind of go, okay, I'm going to do everything myself. And you start to realize, no. That's not the smartest thing. So yeah, yeah, everybody is heart centered. They're all aligned with the mission. And um, I don't have to micromanage or babysit anybody. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome. And also pretty cool that a lot of them are your own family, friends and family. It's really amazing that everybody yeah. gets to contribute, like you said. And and yeah, I very much get the sense that they love what they do and and they are doing their work from a, a heart centered place, like you said. Yeah, in fact, uh, I don't know if you know this about Michelle. Um, she's Glenna's sis twin sister, but Michelle actually does Reiki, which is energy healing. And so every time we have all the packages that are all boxed, you know, all packaged up and ready to go because we have pickups from FedEx, we have pickups from the post office. Well, she literally does Reiki, which is healing energy over all of the packages before they leave every single wow. day. Just to push, you know, love, good energy, the packages get safely to their, you know, to their destination because the things we do go out to heal people. So that just adds this beautiful layer of, of, of literal Reiki energy from someone who is trained in doing Reiki. So it's, it's so completely layered and aligned that um, it, it's, it's pretty amazing. That's beautiful. I love that. No, they are twin sisters, very much twin sisters. And I finally learned how to distinguish the two of them. I've been around them enough at this point that I think I can kind of tell them apart, but that took a very, very long time. That's so cool that they do that. And yeah. it is very much in alignment with what you're sending out with those healing properties. Um, Tim did tell me that we're not supposed to talk about him on this podcast. So I guess that's off limits. We can't talk about Tim, apparently. Um, I think that <laughs> I means do have we to... need to talk all about him. I think I we think need we to should. talk. We need to spend half the time talking about him. <laughs> I think we should. It's been he so fun. We working. can't talk about him. Whatever. I thought you'd like that. <laughs> yeah, that's I thought good. you'd enjoy that. Yeah, he's been so fun to work with over the years. We, you know, we've shared different interests recently. You know, we've both gotten into Formula One. And so we just spend the whole hour long session, three days a week, just talking about Formula One and Did you start that with and him? all that stuff. Are I you the one probably, who got into it? Yeah, I probably started that. Dang, dude. You probably know. know more or just way different things about Tim than I do. I know it's it's weird. You end up learning a lot about your clients and you talk about a lot. And yeah, you end up getting to know these people, I would argue, in some situations more so even than their spouse. If you spent a number of years with somebody in particular with Tim, we really started working in 2009. And I just have to say, too, like, I'm so grateful for people like him. He was one of the first people to reach out after the pandemic for me to write up some workouts for him. And he was one of my first clients back and really was so foundational for my wife and I to like realize like wait we could maybe start our own business we're unemployed from our gym that's closed down for who knows how long 
what the hell are we going to do during this pandemic? And knowing that there were still people out there to serve was wonderful. So always, always, always be so grateful for him. Oh, you no, know, I love the friendship you guys have. And yeah, he, that was one of the first things he said. He's like, are you going to be, would you be comfortable if I had Casey come here to the house and work me out? And I'm like, would I be comfortable? It's like, bring him over. I'll give him a hug right now. So Fantastic. Yes, it's, um, yeah, I, I love that. I love the friendship you guys have. And thank you for keeping my husband in shape. I tell yeah. you constantly to kick his ass. Every time I, every time I see you training him, I'm like, kick his ass. And I try and I keep trying and uh, he keeps coming back. He recovers super quick. Like I said, we do three workouts a week and he works really hard. He deserves all the great fitness that he has at at this stage of his life because he has put in the time and the effort for sure. It's been really cool to be a part of that. Yeah. So we've already talked about him. Yeah, you're very welcome. We've already talked about Tim quite a bit in this episode. Yeah, so so sorry, Tim. You don't get what you want. Exactly. Um, And before we get into your primary work, um, we do have to say also that you are on this podcast because the Boundless Body uh, Board of Directors gathered to say this is going to be our final pitch to you to bring back the Jane Bars. You made a wonderful protein bar that my wife is absolutely super hooked on. She said, the first thing I said when I told her I was interviewing you today was like, tell her hi and tell her to bring back the Jane Bars. So um, what was You had some funny mishaps as far as like making food products. I had no idea how difficult that would be. Can you tell us a little bit about what that process was like about actually creating a consistent food product and putting it out to market? Yeah, it is not an easy thing. And it's not just, I mean, that was the only food product I ever did. And I have had so many people ask me to bring it back. Um, But I do everything else I do, except for the skin stuff is stuff that you ingest. So the hoops that you have to jump through, especially if you have the, the high quality expectations of what I have, I'm not going to put anything out to the public that I personally wouldn't take myself or eat myself or give to my my family or my grandkids. So um, the whole protein bar thing was one of the funnest, funnest things I ever did because I've been making my own homemade protein bars for a long, long, long time. And what I found is I, I dialed it into this really fun recipe. It was my first one was uh, almond coconut. And it was just this amazing recipe. And what would happen is I would take them on hikes. I would take them to the gym because I used to teach classes and I would give them to all my friends and my family members. And then every weekend I found myself stuck in my kitchen making protein bars for other people. And I, and I just thought, well, wait a minute, this is maybe I with, you know, I've been doing manufacturing with my products. And so I found this company in LA. It was a small family owned company that had just moved out of their kitchen. And so they were making protein bars for other people and they had just moved into a facility and were doing it uh, with, you know, for small, smaller vendors and smaller batches. And so I connected with them and I formulated two other recipes and um, the first two or three batches that came, because I had to do things in small batches because I'm a, you know, small company. I'd probably sell a lot more now because I've, I've grown a little bit more since then, but um, the batches were small because there was no preservatives and you can't have something sitting in a warehouse or even a small facility like mine without preservatives. And I didn't want any junk or crap or preservatives. So what, and it was going really, really, really well. And then what happened is I got, it was, I think the third or fourth batch and um, one of the flavors arrived rancid. And it was like, they were, it was a fresh brand new batch. And like, like I said, people have really no idea that one batch for that one bar cost me $20,000. Oh my goodness. And they wouldn't replace it. They wouldn't, they wouldn't fix the problem. And I had to end up, they were, they were, I mean, sort of, I mean, they were, they were edible enough that I was able to donate them to the Utah food bank. So they didn't go to waste, but that was like, I, I can't afford because I was making no profit on these protein bars. They were they were still kind of in the baby phase where I was barely making what it costs to produce them. And I was giving away a lot to, to market them and to let, share them with people. And and so it was kind of a ugh, it was it was a, a kind of a painful experience, but um, I just couldn't. That was just such a massive financial loss that I was like, okay, well, 
I need to back off on that until I can find a different company to yeah. produce them for me and maybe someplace closer because LA to here, in fact, Tim actually drove down. I was going to say. Do you remember that? He drove yes. down and picked up a batch because the shipping was so astronomical. Um, so I had to be really careful. Like I, I needed a place to store them. And if I was going to drive them up here in the summer, it was super hot. And it was just like, so yeah, I, you tell Bethany that she is not the only person who is <laughs> waiting for me to bring these back because I miss them too, to be honest. So that's amazing. Yeah. I totally remember that trip. I remember he had to have the AC like totally jacked the entire time. <laughs> like, yeah. It was like the middle I, of the summer. It was, and yeah. it was, he was picking them up in LA and driving them through the desert of Nevada and all the way are all the way up here. And so, but you know what, Tim is, is married to me and gets lots of adventures. <laughs> <laughs> he sure does. He yeah. sure does. Uh, that's amazing. Well, totally understand, um, you know, why you didn't continue that venture, just not being feasible and having so much energy go towards it and take away from your, you know, original passion, which is working with plants. And yeah. it's so, you know, you know that I follow a carnivore diet and a large portion of our audience follows a carnivore diet because for some reason, for one reason or another, these plant compounds tend to build up and people need to like, abstain from some of them. It's not everybody. It's not all the time. But one thing that I've learned in the carnivore community is that you would, you would kind of think that carnivores hate animals and they absolutely don't. They love and appreciate animals and where their food comes from. And you would think they wouldn't care about plants. And that is not the case. They love plants and are interested by them and respect them and understand that these things have been around far longer than we have. We are fertilizer for plants. They have largely, you know, brought us to where we are today with, you know, like, like, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> um, what's the word? Husbandry. Uh, like, um, like we think, what's the word I'm looking for, Jane? <laughs> Um, I'm not sure. It's not cultivation. Um, um, domestication. Domestication. Oh, okay. Yeah, I domesticated. Trying to think. Total brain fart. Total brain fart. We think that we domesticated plants, but really the reverse happened. We we started agriculture, and and you know all of a sudden we were beholden to some of these grasses and these plants that we were raising for our food. And I just I I, I love the way. Um, our author Larry Keith puts it. She wrote the book The Vegetarian Myth, and she, as a vegetarian and a vegan, had such a hard time drawing the line of where she thought of a sentient being as. Is is it a cow? You know, is it small rodents that get killed when you till up? Um, you know, a farm for agriculture. What about the insects? What about the bacteria in the soil? As a, as a vegetarian vegan, there's always somewhere you had to kind of draw the line. And through her journey with that, she realized you don't need to draw a line. It's a circle. Everything is connected. Plants communicate. They talk. They share. It, it, they make this wonderful culture and they hold everything together. And so I think the topic of plants and botany is absolutely wonderful. And I can see so easily how you would get just absolutely wrapped up in this. Yeah, and the thing is, is um, from my perspective, especially the, the way I grew up and then what I do now, um, the plants that I work with are really on a pretty, they're mostly medicinal. But the thing is there's medicinal properties in the common spices that we use like cayenne and rosemary and basil and all the things that we use even to season maybe the meat we eat because there's so many beneficial properties. And, you know, there are a lot of things about plants, especially with modern agriculture or even the industrial revolution when all of this, the agriculture came about, we do so many things wrong with the way we produce food in the plant world. Like there's a lot of things I stay away from, you know, I just don't, my body doesn't feel good. Like I don't even like kale or spinach really anymore because of all the oxalates in them. But there's, a, the thing is, there's, there's a lot of, medicinal properties like let me I brought up cayenne cayenne is one of my favorites because it's what's known as a vasodilator it actually can go into your stomach and heal an ulcer which you would think would be opposite so it not only helps your heart your veins your vascular system but it nourishes the lining of your stomach and I've had people with ulcers that are caused by stress or caused by whatever an ulcer is caused by for different people and you would think it would be the opposite because you think, well, cayenne pepper would go in, and especially if you're taking a capsule of it, the capsule would dissolve, and then that cayenne would burn your, your ulcer. But it's 
the absolute opposite, opposite. It nourishes and it can heal the lining of your stomach, including an ulcer. So sometimes plants like that can actually give you, well, most of the time, the plants that I work with and deal with and all the things that I do and all the things that I make, they're to heal people. And they're to heal people from things like you know, think about um, parasites. All of us have parasites. We don't want to eradicate them altogether, but we want to bring them into a place of balance, which, you know, that's the whole goal. It's like, you don't want to eradicate a virus because we're, we, not only are we in our microbiome, we have a virome. What keeps us surviving in this world is our ability to adapt to viruses. Our immune system knows how to handle it if we take care of our immune system. But in the case of like a parasite, you could take like cloves. You know, cloves have a compound in there that actually is very powerfully anti-parasitic because it's developed that to keep its own, you know, it's like pesticide, like it's insects and predators away from the clove. But those properties that are anti-parasitic and, and helpful for the clove actually extracted the right way can help with humans. So, I mean, I don't know if that answered your question. I mean, I've been on a whole gamut of diets. I've done, I did vegetarian for 12 years. I did raw, I ate raw foods for, I lasted only about four months on 100% raw. I did feel like a million bucks and I looked like a million bucks too. I looked so good and so young, so much. I just, everything felt good. But then I just started missing warm food. I'm missing food that was cooked. And then, um, about 12 years into vegetarian, I started craving beef. I started craving a filet mignon. It was like, I was started obsessed about it. So I told Tim, okay, <clears throat> I think I need to eat a piece of steak and, and I don't wanna just eat any steak. I want it to be sourced carefully. And, and then I want some herbed butter on it. <laughs> so I ate a steak and I ate the whole thing and I had a lot of people that knew I was vegetarian were a little disappointed in me, Sure, which was fine because it's not about them. It's about me. But also they were like concerned that I might have felt sick because my body wasn't used to it. Yeah, I felt amazing. And I, you know, I think a few months ago, Tim probably told you that, Hey, James, thinking about going carnivore. Did he tell you that? <laughs> he did mention something like that. Yeah. And it's so funny because I think I'm now a little more carnivore than he is because he's the pasta and the bread and all the stuff he so loves. My body doesn't like that. And I don't, I just don't feel good. So anyway, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, that was kind no. of a big long answer. <laughs> I love it. No, absolutely it does. It's just to appreciate that most of us can do fine as long as we're eating whole foods, regardless of whether they're where they're coming from. And right. and we you, we had at some point we had this innate knowledge like you have this beautiful book be your own shaman which i do mean it is beautiful it, it looks amazing the illustrations in it are absolutely amazing i understand your sister did the illustrating um all the photos that are in it it's so informative i absolutely love it to think that you know maybe what was a few generations ago this book would not need to be written because we would have the knowledge of all of these plants around us and what their uses would be like th that's part of being human and what would be passed down through the generations and it's like you said earlier we're so far disconnected yeah. from plants or animals or any of our food that we don't have this knowledge and this book needs to be written yeah i think so too but here's another layer too and this goes with animals as well when if you're thinking about plants like even vegetables that you would maybe grow in your garden or you would just buy in the store we are so disconnected from our food source that that it it doesn't get the attention and the love and the like our energy like whenever we have a garden and we which is every year we make we plant our tomatoes and cucumbers and the things we're going to plant we tend to them and we, nur we nurture them and we prune them and we then we pick them when they're ready and ripe. And so literally the, the nutrients from the food that we grow ourselves is infused from our energy into them, which in turn nourishes us. And I think the same with animals. If um, for you know people who grow and raise their own beef and pigs and whatever animal that you eat, there's a whole different respect that comes from that because you understand where it comes from. In fact, you've probably read the omnivore's dilemma, right? Yeah, fantastic, and Michael Pollan. 
one of my favorite, yeah, Michael Pollan, um, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite books is it's because it's so shows you how connected we are to our food source and how disconnected we've become. And I, I think that if more people can search for local sourcing of where they get their whatever whatever it is you're eating whatever nourishes your body because it is different for for a lot of people you know I, so I, I think it's yeah I think that there's wisdom that is coming back yeah, um, my dad my dad wrote a book which I've taken all the plants in his original book which was 48 and I, and then I added 46 more, but I've taken his plants and I've updated all the pictures and the illustrations and I've just dialed in the content and reformatted the whole thing. But he wrote it when I was in high school, which was more than 40 years ago. And even then, which was in the late seventies, um, we were, we were really at the kind of the height of our being disconnected from our food supply and our food source and our knowledge of uh, the wisdom that comes when we use plant medicine, you know, because think about it, your grandma has a recipe where she puts the chamomile tea with a squirt of lemon and a little bit of honey. And yeah, like there's all these layers and layers of um, wisdom of healing that comes from grandma or your great aunt or your grandpa or everybody can, everybody has that. And I believe that the pandemic has really tuned people back into, oh my gosh, my health is my responsibility. It's not the government's responsibility. It's not even my doctor, but it's my responsibility. So I think that that to me is one of the best beautiful silver linings to come out of this whole last three years. I couldn't agree more. And it was really encouraging to see that, that one of, not one of your busiest, but the thing that took your company that was already successful, even to hire heights of success was 2020. You guys did amazing that year and continued that over time. And so we we do hope that that pendulum does swing back to finding natural cause, nat natural solutions for health rather than just relying on the medical system and a bunch of prescriptions to try to make us better when we're eating terrible food to begin with. It, it sucks, but hopefully people are waking up to this. And again, your book yeah. is such an important part of that and your company. So, so tell us the story of Max and how you got so interested in plants also and why you decided to take over the reins of the company and, and, and how you've grown it over the time, over time. Yeah. So my dad, um, grew up in a family of five boys and two girls. And my grandpa, his dad, owned a, a plumbing and electrical business in Idaho. Um, and out of all the kids in my dad's family, including the two sisters, they all went into the family business, except for my dad. And he, he joined the Navy. He did a four-year stint in the Navy right after the Korean War. And then he went to college and he got his degree in medicinal botany because he was just... That was just where his passion was. So he was the only one who didn't go into the family business. Uh, he met my mom in college and they decided, my mom's like, told him when they were dating, I want a dozen kids. And my dad's like, all right, let's, let's, let's do this. <laughs> so they had 11 and then they adopted three, uh, three wow. Native American kids who um, were tiny. They were all preschool. They were siblings themselves, two, two girls and a boy. And they, they grew up with us. And my dad was just this uh, herbalist, this medicinal botanist. He would, you know, see a plant on the side of the road when we were going somewhere. Like if even if we were driving to church, he'd stop. He we'd all pile out. He'd identify it, and you can use the plant, this part of the plant, and this is how you make it, and this is the time of day you collect it. And and so this was just normal for us. And we had pots growing it, things everywhere, and you know, a big comfrey plant right on the side of the porch, the front porch. And so this, this was normal for, for us. And then what happened, he's he actually, um, and I think this happens more often than, than it probably should, but my dad passed away really young. He was only 62 and I am Sunday. I'm 62, which is a little freaky to me because it's like, I'm the same age that my dad was when he passed away. So his company basically died with him because he had started all these medicinal formulas and he sold them to doctors all, all over. And he was kind of hard to find. He, you know, people, if you were lucky enough to have his phone number, you know, he really ran his company kind of on the lowdown, kind of secretive a little bit. 
And after he passed away, nobody wanted to do, nobody wanted to do that. None of my siblings. And he was, he died so young and none of us were, we never, we didn't have the degree he had. We didn't have the education. We just had the life experience. We just knew that we were dependent on these formulas. So four years after he passed away, um, and I don't know if you know this story, but I was, I was working for 24 hour fitness and I was driving to an appointment. Uh, I was setting up corporate memberships at different companies and I was driving to an appointment and I just had this intuition that I should call my, one of my sisters. Now I have eight sisters. So I'm one of nine girls and five boys. So I had this intuition to call this one particular sister. And I don't ever, if I get a whisper, I get a tap on the shoulder. If there's a message that comes to me, I don't hesitate because I, I've learned that there's something there's something that I need to pay attention to. So in fact, one of the things I told Tim when we first got married is if I have a bad feeling when we're going on a, get on a flight to go to Europe, even if we're in Europe and coming home or wherever, and I have a bad feeling not to get on a plane, you just need to know I'm not going to go. <laughs> like, you just need to know that about me. This was way before we got married. Yeah. <laughs> so I had this intuition to call my sister and I called her up and I said, Hey, what are you doing? She's like, well, I'm driving to have lunch with this lady who's a botanist and her grown daughter who's in college to become a botanist. And I'm, I'm selling her all of dad's formulas. And I was like, what? Like she hadn't consulted any of us. And I, I think that had four years had passed. She just didn't really, I don't think she really thought about it. Um, and I just, so I, I said, well, don't do that. I think I want to do that. And I, I was just not that happy where I was in corporate America. I still love fitness. I still continue to teach classes um, for 20 more years. Um, but it was, so it was that, that download that I got, that whisper, intuition. Um, and it, it, it just started from there. It's been 21 years now that I've been going. And I tell you, I have regular inspiration. I know my dad is guiding me. Um, and it's, it's, I couldn't be in a more perfect place for me. And all my siblings are like so grateful that I carry these on because one of the main reasons I did this is so that I could provide all of my dad's formulas to my siblings and their kids because we, that, that's our medicine cabinet. Like that, that's how we grew up. So it's been the most beautiful gift. And yeah, my dad was a amazing kooky, um, he was, he didn't believe in paying taxes and he didn't believe in carrying a driver's license. And I mean, he was, he was like a freedom loving, um, flag, you know, he probably would have been a MAGA person, <laughs> but <laughs> he was way, he left the earth way before that. So yeah, what, if what I a were wonderful, to <laughs> it's a wonderful story. All of it, how, yeah. um, how you grew up in that and, and literally rooted in that and how you're able to carry on the tradition. I know, obviously, you've expanded quite a bit over the original products that he was doing, but there's always been a flagship route that has really kind of been the primary kind of a kind of plant that you guys use. And I always know when it's harvest season, you guys do your own harvesting of it. And yeah. I'll walk into the warehouse, train Tim, and this wall of aroma hits me right in the face, like, oh, I know if I just marinated that for like an hour during our session, there's no chance I'm getting a cold or a flu or anything for the next year that I'm, I'm good to go. It's great. Tell us about your main flagship product. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's uh, you're in a rare, very small handful of people who get to see that process. Um, I cool. have people tell me all that I have customers from all over say, I'd love to come and see what you do. And, and it's just like, you know, so it's cool that you get to experience that because we really do harvest everything. In fact, the, the plant is called Lomatium and it only grows in the wild in the Pacific Northwest. And we go out every fall as a family and we cultivate it or no, we don't cultivate it, we wildcraft it. So it's never been successfully cultivated, which means people have tried, even we've tried, my dad tried, gather a bunch of seeds and plant them and try to cultivate them. Uh, but we do know how to harvest it sustainably and we actually have now property in Idaho where it grows and we're able to wildcraft it on our own property. But its main properties are that it's antiviral and it's a Native American plant that was actually studied, studied extensively 
right after one of the biggest pandemics, the 1917-1918 Spanish flu. Um, there was a doctor named Dr. E.T. Krebs Sr., who was the contract physician for where he, he was a, a MD who practiced in San Francisco. And what the United States government did during that pandemic is they assigned a physician to every group all, all around the US. So Dr. Krebs was the contract physician to go and get stats and take, you know, this was before, of course, we could do with computers and testing and all that stuff. So one of the areas where he was uh, assigned was um, near Carson City, Nevada. There were two Native American tribes, Washu Indians, that were there and they were using this plant, this lamation, during the pandemic, but they've been also using it, you know, in this indigenous culture for hundreds of years. This was not you know, talk about deep, rich wisdom of plant medicine. The most indigenous cultures is so beautiful and so deep. But what he did during the whole pandemic is not, he realized that not one person from either one of those two tribes died. During, they got sick, they got the virus, but they, they, didn't, they didn't die. So after the pandemic was over, he took Lomation back to his practice in San Francisco and started studying it in his own practice. And this is a medical doctor. This wasn't a naturopath or, you know, and what we, I, you know, I, I don't even like to call alternative medicine. To me, that's traditional medicine is yeah. when we heal with plants and natural things. But he started using it in his own practice. And then what happened is, I think it was night, it was written up in the Journal of Bacteriology in 1942. And I, found the study and I have it, it's amazing. But then I think it was 1944 when penicillin was discovered. So here's this modern drug that is being touted as, you know, the end all be all. And then nobody wanted to use an old Indian remedy, which was this lamation. So that's kind of like the history of how it got into the, I think it would have been, a, gotten a lot more legs if, if it had not, you know, you, there's not a lot of profit in it because right. it, you can't patent it. But right. his son, E.T. Krebs Jr. Um, went on to study this plant and my dad worked with E.T. Krebs Jr. And they studied it for about 30 years. And we, you know, my kids used it when they were babies, my grandkids. It's one thing I just, if I could only pick one herb to take me through this life, it would be that plant. That's amazing and so beautiful. And what yeah. interesting timing of all of that. Couldn't yeah. have been worse for Lamation because you're converging the very beginning of a pharmaceutical industry with the the medical the whole like epicenter of medicine shifting from Germany over to the United States and we start this allopathic way of treating people with pills and changing our diets and recommending processed foods and seed oils it, and what a horrible like oh, few chain of events in, in in a few years that really doomed us to the poor health that we experience today yeah. um it's it's really cool to hear that story. I love that. How, in what forms would people take lamation? Like, what, what is it? A pill? Is it a powder? Like, how how are these how are these taken from a root to be something that we can then use for our benefit? Yeah. So this particular plant is it. The part of the plant you use is the root, and when the root is pulled out, then within twenty four hours we have to chop it up in slices and lay it on drying racks, and it where it needs to cure and all of the oils and all the properties of the root need to basically oxidize where that and that's part of what gives it its power and then after 30 to 60 days depending on how long it takes um, it's either ready to put into the barrels and then we take it down to uh, our manufacturer it's just down in spanish fork and they'll either put it into a tincture so you take it you grind it up um, the root after it's been dried and cured, and then you put it into, we use organic cane alcohol as 190 proof. And I actually still make some um, homemade batches for myself and my family, just because that is a tradition. And I love, I love having herbs curing in my, you know, in, in, at my, in my home. So it's either made into a tincture because the alcohol actually helps ex extract all the medicinal properties out of the plant. And it is very, it's strong, it's potent, it's powerful. And so we always suggest you add it to a little bit of water to take it. And what's nice about a liquid like that is it goes right to the bloodstream and it's very fast acting.
but we also put it into like a throat spray. We have about 14 herbs in a throat spray that's in vegetable glycerin. It's extracted in alcohol first, but then we reduce it down and then we reconstitute it in vegetable glycerin. But then we also put it into capsules along with a couple other herbs that help absorb some of the oils and also work kind of synergistically with the lamation. So we use dandelion root, which is really good for your liver and red root, which is helps clear mucus out of your organs. And because you can't put lamation through an encapsulating machine because it's too sticky. So we had to put something, in fact, when my dad was alive, we used to hand encapsulate lamation. <laughs> like we'd sit wow. and hand encapsulate. And for wow. the first few years that I started, restarted his company, I did that too. We, I would, my nephews and what some, you know, my nieces, you know, in fact, Ben got through college by hand encapsulating lamation. That's amazing. <laughs> I'm not kidding. So <laughs> you, you can put it in different forms, um, but it's, it's all, it's all beautiful and beneficial and really amazing. That's very cool. The Ben you're referring to, Ben Hardy, who is a best-selling author, who just yeah. came out with a book that came out today, the day of recording, which is amazing. Cool to yeah. know that's where he got to start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Ben is, uh, he, in fact, I, I, I'm just going to give a quick shout out because his, this new book is called 10X is Easier Than 2X. And um, it's, I would say by far his best book his mm -hmm. best book. And his last book was actually endorsed, endorsed by Tony Robbins. So was this that a gap book, in the game. That's the gap in the game. Yeah. 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 But yeah. this book is, you know, think about entrepreneurs. We always think if I could just double my business, I'd be good. You know, if I could just do double what I'm doing, but he shows by the research he's done and, and this whole concept of 10 X being easier than two X you can. And, and he's not just talking about a business. You can 10x your relationship, your abundance, whatever it is that you want. And it's really about freedom. It's about getting rid of 80% of the fluff and the stuff that, which might mean sometimes relationships. But anyway, I just interviewed him to put on my YouTube channel. So oh, all fantastic. of his stuff is still fresh in my brain. Um, fantastic. It's, a, it's an amazing read. Wow, that's great. I loved his last book. I thought the concept of the gap in the gain was really interesting. We're always looking at the gap that we have to, um, you know, the people that we admire and respect. And yeah. you've been in business for so long. I could look at your business. Ours is only three years old and say, wow, she's so successful. I'll never get to that spot without realizing like, no, we've been doing great for three years. Like, look how far we've come and understanding yeah. the difference between those things. I, I really yeah. love the concept of that book. He's a wonderful author. So I appreciate yeah. the shout out. <laughs> um, okay, so we talk about lamation. Now, there's lots of different um, herbs that you wrote about. Like you said, there was already 48 that your dad had wrote, written about. You added some more. So it, it And you do such a great job in the book kind of explaining what their uses are for. And so there's some herbs that we should probably be taking maybe daily, weekly, with some regularity, kind of all the time. And there's others that have very specific uses. Can you talk about maybe a few examples and and and, and some differences between those? Yeah. So, I mean, one of my favorites we talked about a little bit earlier is cayenne pepper. Because of how good it is for your heart, um, cayenne is something that I take in capsule form every day. And I've been doing that for, well, since I was about 35. Because there's a few herbs my dad is just like, okay, when you get to be 35, you just add these to your to your to your daily routine. Um, cayenne is one of them, just because of it's it's one of the most simple, humble, easy to get, inexpensive herbs, but it's such a powerhouse. Um, I think it depends a lot of it depends on where you are in life. You know, as I have gotten older, like of course I'm out on the other side of menopause, which it took me. I was in total denial that I was in menopause because when you say that you feel like you're an old lady, but I realized that I needed some, I needed to start doing some stuff different and that I was truly in menopause. So all the way through that, I used adaptogenic herbs, things like rhodiola and maca root and suma root, and even some mushrooms like cordyceps and reishi. Those are really good adaptogens, which help balance body chemistry, help actually help balance your hormones. So I, and, and I still do some adaptogens, but I don't do it quite as hardcore as I did. Um, I've really, the last probably 10 years, been really focused on herbal nootropics, things for my brain health, just because not just, you know, just like we take care of our heart with exercise and we take care of our brain by 
exercise and, and brain, different things we do for our brain, the help from herbs is absolutely amazing and powerful. And so um, I developed a brain formula about eight or nine years ago. And I've just, in the last couple of years, added lion's mane to it. And I put lion's mane in the book. And what I also did in that I've added to the, my dad's uh, first original 48 plants were really very medicinal. And mine are too, but I added a whole section of spices. And it's it, they're mixed in with the, with the others. In fact, I've completely reconfigured the, the uh, order of all of them. But, you know, things that people can have easy access to. I don't think we realize the power of basil and rosemary and thyme and chervil and win winter savory and cilantro. And, you know, cilantro, if, you, if your body craves cilantro, um, that means you probably need to detox for, for some, from some heavy metals because cilantro is a chelator. It attaches to heavy metals and you expel it through your urine. So, I mean, so it really just, I mean, this is why I, one of the reasons I really wanted to update my dad's book, add more to it, because I don't think people realize the power just in the little tiny things, even, you know, like you said, a lot of your listeners are carnivores or they follow that diet. Well, the things that you use to season, it doesn't have to be in big amounts, but absolute power for your digestion, your metabolism, balancing your body chemistry, your elimination even sometimes and helping your body detox from heavy metals and maybe stimulating your lymphatic system. I mean, it's like echinacea stimulates your lymphatic system. So it's, it's just a matter of learning and then just going, you know, baby steps into it because it can seem overwhelming a little bit. Yeah, it definitely can. And that brings up another interesting question. Like, can I, can I go to the grocery store and buy a $1 bottle of whatever, say basil or something? Is that going to be, this can be vastly different than what I would expect to get from some of your products that have it more concentrated? Are they the, the same? Um, how do we think about that as far as like using specific products that have been distilled in a certain way or turned into a tincture like you do versus like just spices in the diet? Yeah, well, I mean, basil is a perfect example you can literally keep a basil plant in your kitchen in your kitchen window and have fresh basil all all year uh, and i would highly suggest that same with rosemary you know you put your rosemary rosemary's perennial put it outside in the summer and then in the as it gets close to being winter if you're a place where if you have a deep winter bring it in and use it um, but things like you know things like basil don't make a good tincture because basil and even cilantro basically turns into, they turn kind of slimy in a tincture. So I personally probably wouldn't tincture things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, no, that's really good to think about. And I love your expertise in that area. Not everything has to be turned into a different no. form. Yeah, no. it, it can just be yeah consumed that way. Um, you mentioned adaptogens. I'm so glad you mentioned that. I had specific questions here as well. I have taken rhodiola and cordyceps before together. Um, this is when I was competitive cycling. And somebody told me before I took them to expect within about a month or so of taking them that it would feel like I was... I, I was like on a whole nother level. Somebody else told me that like, this is the, the closest thing you can do legally to doping. And I can absolutely say that taking those adaptogens was as close to doping as probably somebody could get. My performance went through the roof. I couldn't mm -hmm. believe the difference. Uh, can you tell us about adaptogens? What are they? And, and what do they help us with? Yeah, so if you think about humans, modern humans, we deal with a ton of stress. And it's not stress like we're running for our lives or running, you know, running from a tiger or it's it's simply modern stress. We get caught in traffic, we have a deadline at work, our relationship, maybe we had an argument with our spouse. And or just living in a modern world is is stressful, but the problem is is we get used to it. And we, we think it's normal. We think it's normal to have that kind of stress, but it's not. And we live in this kind of constant state of, of adrenal burnout. And our, you know, we, but we don't really realize what's happening. And we, you know, maybe drink too much, we smoke too much weed, we whatever, whatever it may be, we we then we take things to help help calm us down, which again is not also not good for us. It's not good for us to drink too much. 
you know, all these things. So adaptogens, this is again, perfection of mother nature. They literally help to bring your body in balance and help your body realize, oh, this is just modern stress. I'm not running from a tiger for my life. I'm just dealing with, a, I'm in bad traffic right now. So, and it's, so these are, these are things that don't make you groggy. They don't make you sleepy, but a lot of times they do give you extra performance as in the case of not just cordyceps, but I don't know if you realize turkey tail mushrooms. I don't know if you've done any research on them. Talk uh -huh. about like, to me, like I love lion's mane for its cognitive and it also has some adaptogenic properties. But what I love about turkey tail is it actually is like taking your immune system to the gym and working it out. That's what turkey tail does is it just keeps your immune system like on fire as far as in a good, on a good, good, good way, because there's so many things that come at us. Now, um, as far as uh, adaptogens that I would suggest pretty much anyone look into, Suma root. So it's S-U-M-A. It grows in Brazil. It's the only place where it grows. And I've been using Suma root for a, a probably 15, probably 15 years. Suma is really well known for what it does for hormones and in particular testosterone and estrogen. And in the fact where if you're really low in estrogen or testosterone, because men and women have both, it's not just men who has testosterone and it's not just women who has estrogen. And then same with progesterone, but if your body is out of balance for whatever reason, and when I used it, it was because of the whole menopause thing, it literally can help bring those hormone levels back into balance. That's what SUMA does. So if you have, say, as a woman, I'm producing too much testosterone, um, it will bring it into balance. It, 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 adaptogens help your body recognize when it's out of balance. And in the case of something like SUMA, it can literally help your body understand what it needs to do to come back into balance. So, and there's a wide range of different adaptogens. So I love that you had that experience with cordyceps and rhodiola because those are those are on the top of my list for sure cool it was it was a powerful effect that i noticed i love that yeah. you explained the stress and and you're right there is a huge difference between acute stress and chronic stress today we have chronic stress yeah. and even running away from the lion like or the tiger like yeah that's pretty stressful and mm -hmm. your life is on the line you, you didn't do that every single day that wasn't a weekly event that was a very rare occurrence and yeah we need a system in our body to deal with acute stress but it's it's just that that low level every single day like soul crushing you're not getting outside you're watching too much tv that kind of stress it, it you're right it, it's building up and it's terrible and as humans we're not used to it and of course it's going to cause problems so anything that can help us adapt to that stress and bring us down i think is yeah. so valuable or you're um, scrolling you, social media that's stressful oh I mean, it's the worst it's the worst it's, it's the worst twitter is the worst one too like i try to just drop things there and never look at it but from time to time i'll catch myself scrolling and getting pissed off at avatars on a screen it's like what am i doing like Put the phone down, go, go outside and hear the birds tweet. That's the only tweet you really care about. <laughs> uh, so you also, as a company, decided to do CBD products. What has that been like? And what are some of the benefits that you wanted to um, expose by using CBD? Yeah, I love, I, I've been using CBD in my own life for a while, like in the, uh, like CBD rub and CBD, uh, a tincture of CBD and the tincture that I've always used is, is in, in hemp oil. So, yeah, I mean, we, we've, what happens is we've had people that will ask for something and then it starts to grow. Like people will ask for, you know, why don't you carry CBD? I would trust, I would really trust your quality and your sourcing. And so about a year and a half ago, we brought four CBD products in. Um, we do a soft gel, we do a tincture, uh, and we do a rub, an intensive rub, and we do a bath bomb. And um, just besides my own experience with it, um, I don't think most humans, and unless you've researched CBD and all of the benefits of it, I still think the majority of, of humans don't realize how powerful CBD is. And it, of course, comes from the hemp plant. But in the 1980s, it was discovered that we have an endocannabinoid system. So we have the receptors that recognize CBD and know how to put it to work for us. So it's one of those things that um, I was just, I was just like, okay, I use this myself. I need to bring, I need to get a really good source. 
and I need to bring these into my line. So it's just something that um, was a natural fit, a progression as, as I've been going along that, and, and it's, it's been amazing. In fact, just this week, we should be getting uh, two pet CBD products in. One wow. is uh, treats, like little training treats, and then one is uh, drops that are specifically for your pets. Wow. Because people are like, can we give these to our pets? It's like, no, no, no. You know, because we have essential oils. We have peppermint essential oil in our CBD drops, but dogs and cats can't handle peppermint essential oil. So there's a special formula just for pets. But yeah, I mean, I think um, the whole, there's a whole interesting conversation around not just CBD, but even psychedelics, because it's plant medicine and it, you do need to use care. You still need to use your smarts and your education. It's just like with anything, you know, even when we are talking about Lomation, Lomation, you, you know, some people get a detox rash from it. So you have to understand, you know, what's happening. So there's, there's, there's deep wisdom and there's deep education that comes along with plant medicine besides just picking up a bottle of echinacea on a health food store shelf. You know, that's, that's a powerful plant, but it's a little benign. It's not going to really do anything or hurt you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. The the whole plant medicine, illegal psychedelic stuff is so exceedingly stupid. It blows my mind. It's so dumb. The war on drugs has been a huge, huge failure. It's a huge failure. Did you, did you see Michael Pollan's uh, series on Netflix? I haven't watched it yet. Um, uh, What was the name of his recent book where he, how to change your mind how to change your mind yeah it is so good it's four it's only four four episodes it's all it's a psychedelic on each one wow it's so i'm with you a thousand percent like let's uh, just stop that nonsense already it's so dumb it's so dumb unfortunately i'm always watching uh formula one drive to survive on netflix i just keep watching on a loop so i don't i don't have any time for that no i would love to watch it and i know you just attended a course with people it sounded like it was people in the medical space, there were also at least learning about this. That, I, and I, Tim and I kind of talked about this, that, that's kind of a weird kind of space to be in around this stuff. Is some of them are, are illegal. And, you know, especially if you're in the medical system, they might be weird to talk about. But can you tell us a few of the things you learned at, at this gathering? And are you optimistic that the, the, this message will get out to more people and more people can use more of these plant medicines in the future? Yeah, that is such a great question. And I'm actually so happy that it took a turn for this because this is something I'm just dipping my toe into as far as I don't, you know, the CBD I've done, there's only been a little bit that I've used with THC. And this was after I had my knee surgery. I, but as far as the psychedelics like psilocybin, MDMA, even LSD, which is, you know, people think LSD is this horrible thing that is going to addict you and make all your teeth fall out and you're going to not be able to function in society. And if, and this is where, if you watch this, this little docu-series on Netflix about um, how to change your mind, first one they talk about is LSD and it goes into the history of why it was even made illegal in the first place. You know, there's this huge rise of consciousness that was happening because people were realizing that they were, they, we are pure love. And, and at, in, when the Vietnam War started, and there was this whole, you know, the hippie season, the hippies, and they they were all doing these things that were mind altering. And they were it was waking them up to the fact that I don't want to go overseas and kill this person because he's my brother. And so they had to make everything illegal so that young men would be willing to go off and kill someone and go potentially be killed themselves. I mean, that's a whole other thing. But I really believe that um, plant medicine on that level needs to be done with care because you can have these not just mind altering um expand your consciousness but you can realize maybe your deeper purpose and so this this workshop i went to it was a week long and it's this couple they live in austin and they came to to salt lake and they did a this was their first training here but and we didn't do psychedelics that we didn't learn we only learned about what they were training people to do was to facilitate. So there were, there were a couple of emergency room doctors in there. There were some nurses that these are all, half of them were medically trained people. Me, I was just there to learn. I just wanted to know 
I just want to know more about this stuff. And this couple that lives in Austin, they're my, they've been my friends for a long time. I helped her through a medical situation with some herbs a long time ago. And so when I heard they were coming here, I'm like, I want to go. But the thing is, is when you go into a psychedelic journey, you need to be prepared. You need to have someone that can facilitate. And there's all these nuances of, are you prepared to go into this? When you're in your journey, is someone sitting with you who knows how to guide you when you're in it? Because there's people who have these blissful, beautiful journeys, but there's also people who, who have trauma come up that needs to heal. And there's, so there's someone needs to be there to facilitate that. And then when the journey's over, say someone comes out of it and they're like, I'm in the wrong marriage, I'm in the wrong job. I, and they blow up their life because they, they realize their purpose and they realize that everything that they've been doing is, is not what is not right. But you can't do that. You can't. So you've got to have someone that actually facilitates coming out of a journey. And, and not everybody wants to do that, you know, but there are people who, you know, that, that, that might want to blow up their life. So this is this this whole workshop was just um, there was just so much. It was a lot of psycho, like psychology on just the human behavior and how to be a good facilitator. That's what the whole it was a really amazing, amazing a whole week. In fact, I, at the end of the day, um, it ended at eight o'clock at night and I came home and, and I was just like mentally exhausted because when you get that much learning and Tim's like, tell me all about it. And <laughs> here's some food and you let's talk about it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, there's just so much. How do I, so, and I just kind of wanted to just chill. So I shared as much as I could. And, um, it was just these, and they're going to come back to Utah because the reception was so amazing. And, Anyway, yeah. I, I hope, hope that, that answers your question. It does. And I hope that gains traction. It's really yeah. important. And it's just like one more lesson that like if we respect these plants and we realize that yeah. they have so much to teach us, they're a lot smarter than we are, like we can access some of their gifts, which is really wonderful. And we do have to keep in mind that all of these things are somewhat of a supplement, right? They're part of yes. a healthy yes. lifestyle. You are turning 62, which is unbelievable if you're watching this. You look like you're 29. Oh you're my gosh. You're so nice. You're the Thank fountain you. of youth. Every time I see you, you're you're bubbly and happy and moving around all over the place. What are some of the other things that you like to incorporate in your life and make pillars of a healthy life? Well, yeah, that's a, such a good question. Um, here's one thing I've really discovered is that I have no credibility if I don't practice what I preach. And the older I get, um, it's like, it's obvious just, and, and you know what, there's wrinkles coming and there's things, I look at sometimes the skin on my arm, I'm like, what the heck, who is that, what is that, but you know what, you also, this is where meditation comes in, um, you realize that this body is a vehicle that takes you through all these life experiences, um, getting out in nature is really, really important, grounding, you know, get, take your shoes off, stand in the grass, you know, get yourself some grounding. I sleep with a grounding mat too, because in the winter here in Utah, you can't really get outside and stand on the grass because the grass is covered in snow or it's too cold. Um, I think that you have to have friendships and a deep connection with other people because we are social creatures. In fact, I'm sure you've probably heard, uh, listened to the, or read the Blue Zones, right? Yes, Dan Buner. Yeah, so it's like, the, these longest, these pockets of longest living humans, the biggest factor for their longevity was were their social connections. So being socially connected to somebody is not on social media. This is really, really important. And I think as we move into technology that is growing exponentially, especially with AI, which we need to be super, super, super careful with, um, I think it's really important to disconnect from your technology, get outside, you have to get good sleep, you have to stay hydrated, pay attention to your body. If your body's saying, don't eat that, like tune in, you know, Tim always says, oh, how do you have so much willpower? And, when, and I'm like, it's not, it doesn't take that. Like, I don't, I don't feel tempted by something that, you know, I know is gonna, is not, it's not right for me. So I think, you know, it's a, it's a bunch of layers of stuff. I love exercise. I work out every single day. I think that if anybody's watching this and they haven't got that piece 
clicked in, start walking. And I know everybody's different. Some, maybe, maybe someone's listening in there in a wheelchair. There's still something you can do. Absolutely. But most of us aren't. Most of us are physically able to go out and go for a walk, connect with mother nature, leave your effing phone at home or in your car. Do not, and you know, they'll say, oh, I needed to take pictures. Try it. If you have anxiety when you leave your phone at home, that means you have a problem. <laughs> great point. Wow, great point. So many awesome and wonderful practical tips. I'm, I'm so grateful for this conversation. I can tell just from knowing you for so long that like you really do come from the heart when you're running your business. It, it's done in the right way with the right people. It's The products are wonderful. I've used many of them. Can you tell our listeners where they can go to find you and connect with you and your work? And also, you have so many different things going on. Do you, are you still doing your courses? You've got your book, um, all the YouTube content that you're doing. Uh, what can people expect when they look you up? Um, well, so yeah, I have a YouTube channel. It's Barlow Herbal. I'm actually now posting on Rumble as well. because I have a lot of people that you need to get on Rumble. So anything in this, I just started. Um, so and it's just at Barlow Herbal. So B-A-R-L-O-W-H-E-R-B-A-L. And that's the name of my website, BarlowHerbal.com. Uh, we're on social media. <laughs> we are on social media <laughs> under Barlow Herbal. Yeah. I, and I, this is where you just get to be strategic, right? Um, and then I, I have an online course where I teach people and I can teach uncensored, which is really beautiful. That's why I started the course about four years ago. And you can, I can go on, I can teach people how to take care of their health the way I would do it. And I don't have to worry about, is someone going to censor me? And so this is just a platform that's open. Um, people comment underneath the modules. I'm continually adding new content and, but yeah, I'm pretty easy to find. That's awesome. And um, I do have to say before we leave, your art is amazing. <laughs> Tim just showed me one you. of your latest paintings. It also got into um, a restaurant downtown. Is that right? Yeah, there's a restaurant. They were just named uh, the number. They were in the top 10 restaurants in Salt Lake City this year. Um, wow. It's called Ochre, spelled like the mountains. And I have about 40 or 50 pieces in there. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> So if the yeah. Barlow Herbal doesn't work out, you could always just be a professional <laughs> artist. You know what? This is what I think. I think all of us have some type of creative spark in us. And this is what grounds me and centers me when I can disconnect because we all have these monkey brains, right? And, and maybe for you and for Tim or whatever, it's watching Formula One or where you can literally disconnect. You can have something that, um, you know, and for, for me, it's painting. So it's like, you know, I, I, I'm not a big TV watcher. I do prefer documentaries uh, to almost anything else. I can't, I can't even hardly stand to go to the movie theater anymore. I just feel like it's just a remake of something. It's just, I just, I, so, so I paint and it's, That's I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I love well, it. I can tell, and you're very, very, very good at it. Again, oh, Tim showed me one of your latest ones that was kind of the same style that you've done in the past, but a little bit different, and it, it is wonderful. So, um, Did he actually first... show you? He showed me, yeah. Oh my gosh, that's funny. He was he really proud he of, doesn't really, proud of you. He doesn't really, he's not very effusive with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was very proud of you, like I said, and, and yeah, it was, it was awesome to see. So uh, all of your many talents, um, we're so grateful for you for sharing them with us today. And thank you for taking the time out of your busy life and your busy day to chat with us here. We really, really appreciate you. Oh, thank, thanks, Casey. Finally, yeah. after three years, huh? Way, way overdue, like we said in the introduction. Yeah, no, it's just it's so perfect. lovely to have a chat. Well, yeah. and we'll see you soon because you're a constant in our lives. Yep, see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Casey. Thank you so much. And this has been another episode of Balanced Body Radio.